Good morning, YouTube. <laughs> All right. As you can see, we are no longer in Little Blue. I actually have uh, the vibe right now. Totally emptied out. Uh, fresh canvas. And uh, we're going to be turning it into... I guess uh, not a minivan, but a stealth crossover. I, I, I don't know if the vibe is considered a crossover. I guess it would be a crossover. It's um, it looks like an SUV, but it's like small. It's like a, it's between the size of an SUV. Well, it's actually as small as a car. So the vibe um, is like a car, but instead of a, a back area with a, a trunk that takes up the the majority of the rear there. It's got like an open area, kind of like you would have in a minivan or an SUV. So it's got a little bit more room than a car, but it's actually very small. If you guys have seen the um, the previous episodes where I showed the vibe, um, it's a small vehicle. It's like two thirds the size of Little Blue, which is a minivan. So there's obviously a lot less space. I've got this. Uh, back seat down right here because I was kind of um, laying it out how I think I'm going to do it. Um, ultimately, I guess if, if you had a vehicle like this or car or whatever and you were trying to convert it for like full-time living and you weren't concerned about whether or not the vehicle could be used like a regular vehicle again, you might want to remove all the seats, you know, just to give yourself a little bit more, more room. But it, if you just want to go simple, this vibe right here has um, seats that fold totally flat and you know that was done on purpose by the the designers so that you could haul cargo you could haul like um, I think you could probably haul uh, two what, what do they call those um is it like a four by eight sheet of wood I don't know if that'll fit in there but I think it will if not almost that size will fit in there it's pretty big back there for a small car because the walls are thinner than they are on a minivan um, and they've made the um, the floor surface totally almost totally flat when you, you fold everything out so I've been looking at it and trying to figure out what I want to do exactly because I can't really modify or I don't really want to modify this vehicle you know by um, building building inside it you know, like I don't want to drill holes in it and put beams across and do all the things that you would do if you were fully converting this vehicle out. But at the same time, I want to make it really comfortable, you know, not just like um, everything back and throw it back there and a little ice chest, you know, and maybe a, a butane or a propane stove. And, you know, you might even have a small little battery, one of those, um, like, Jackeries or, or, like, the little battery packs, you know, the, the jump start packs or something like that. Which is kind of what I did last time, just to show you what could be done if you needed, like, a weekend camper or you were taking a trip somewhere. But this time, uh, I'm actually going to be trying to deck this out so that you could actually live in it if you had to. And I've been looking at the different options. And the other plan is potentially to have it so two people could live in it, which is kind of crazy because it's like a little car. <laughs> I just, but I, you know, people do it. You know, um, I've seen um, people who were homeless having to live out of a vehicle. And sometimes there's like a whole family, like a uh, mommy and daddy and uh, one or two kids, which is they're basically just sleeping in the seats. You know, sleeping, sitting, which is sad. Um, I tried laying myself out in here and I'm like, well, if I configure it for one person, it's very much doable. It can be made, I think, to be very comfortable uh, for one person. For two people, there might have to be some adaptations. Um, and then it also depends on what you want to include with it. You know, how, how far you want to take the, the conversion. Like I said, at the lowest level, sleeping bags, ice chest, uh, butane or propane stove, and you're all set and a little Jackery or um, jump starter battery pack. And you have power to charge your phones and stuff. But I think what I'm gonna do with this one this time, 
I'm going to try to make it so that I can build a modular unit, you know, going on kind of similar to Tim's theme. I don't know if you guys saw uh, Timothy Mo Bang for Your Bucks, his channel. Um, he had a really good series going on with the Sienna. Sadly, as I understand it, the Sienna ended up dying. <laughs> that's, that's the one thing about uh, living in a vehicle and, and driving it. And he decided to take it on a, a road trip, I guess, a, a you know, far road trip, long range. And it didn't. He didn't make it through the desert or whatever. It ended up having issues. So he's got a new vehicle, which is uh, similar to this one. I think he got a, um, what did he get? It's one of those little tiny cube cars. But I think it might be exactly like this or similar to this. I'll, I'll have to double check his video, but it's small like this. Um, so he's doing a build on that. So make sure you follow that series to see what can be done with small cars. I am going to build this one out, but still debating on how I want to do it um, because I want to make sure that whatever I do can be removed very quickly, like easily, and that whatever I do isn't like a big, huge, like, like I don't want to build something that's huge, that when you remove it, it's still huge. Because if it's huge and you remove it, it's still huge, you have to have storage somewhere, you know, which those of you who have a house with a garage or something, you're not going to have that issue. But someone like me, you know, I'm currently living out of the RV. Uh, storage is already a premium. I'm still having a, huff, a hard time throwing things away from the RV. It's just, it's got all the storage from all the stuff, of, you know, from where I lived. Every, every time I had a building or whatever, from all the way from when I had a house. So it's got these um, bins full of junk, which I'm still sorting through and just uh, slowly but surely getting rid of. So, having to store the, the van build or the car build inside the RV when it's not being used isn't exactly um, something I'm looking forward to unless I can make it so that the build itself is collapsible. So, that's kind of a criteria I'm giving myself is, um, one, it has to be easy to put in and out of this RV, not RV, this, um, this little car, this little Pontiac Vibe. Um, for those of you who don't know what a Vibe is, it's, it's similar to the Pontiac, I mean the uh, Toyota Matrix. They're pretty much the same car, just rebranded. And um, so the, the first criteria is that it's modular. It should be removable very quickly and installed very quickly. When I say very quickly, I'm hoping it shouldn't take more than five minutes. <laughs> You're like, whoa, how's he going to do a build that doesn't take more than five minutes? That's the goal, but it could end up taking 10 or 15 minutes you know, to assemble. And the idea would be that um, doing this, somebody who um, wanted to go for like a weekend camp or something like that could get ideas to do something similar to their car or their, preferably their SUV or um, crossover vehicle, you know, something that has a, a little bit more room than a car. If you, if you want to do something like this on a car, you can see that whole back, that whole back chunk area right there. See, a normal car would have the seats right here. And then that, that section back where you see the, the back wall of the car, that's all a part of the chunk. So what you would have to do if you really wanted to do something similar to this in a, a car, you have to remove the seat. You have to remove that rear seat or if your rear seat folds all the way down and you can see through to the trunk, you know, like your feet can stick through, then that would allow you to make a full length bed. That's one of the things I wanted was um, the ability to pretty much full length, you know, laying down. Um, now, I did a, a test again, you know, although I did it in the past. I did it again just to see how much length I had. And essentially, if I wanted to lay straight, you know, flat, you know, like a, instead of in a fetal position, which most people, most people when they sleep, they usually sleep in a fetal position. You know, they curl up a little bit. So you're only really like two thirds your height. So I'm 5'10", okay? That means roughly about four foot eight, you know, four foot six is how much space I need to sleep in a fetal position. If I try to sleep totally stretched out, I'm gonna need at least 5'10". Now, if I pick this front seat next to me, I know you guys can't see it, but where my hand is right here is the front seat, and I slide it forward, you know, and I bend the seat forward, I can get that full more than, you know, than six feet of space in this car. 
but I don't really want to do that either because then that means moving the seat forward and um, making major adjustments. I did try just sliding the seat, you know, moving the, there's a little lever that goes under the front seat that will slide it forward. And I did that and it slides up about another eight inches. Then I had the front seat just bend over a little bit. And I think there's enough room going that way to potentially lay straight. You know, somebody who's six, more than six foot would have a hard time with that. But I think someone like my height, 5'10 and below, should be able to lay down. Um, so that's what I'm potentially looking at. And then the other thing I'm, I'm looking at, instead of um, just like a weekender, you know, a weekender, I wouldn't bother putting a, a full-blown battery power system into this. So because I'm trying to make this potentially for living in, if I have to live in an extended period, like months or weeks or years, <laughs> you want it as self-contained as possible. So that means a full power system. So instead of um, just going small and simple with a Jackery or a uh, power pack, I'm thinking of making um, a full-blown power pack system using a 12-volt RV battery. And from my experience with Little Blue, if I can use two of them, you know, at least two batteries, that would give me 200 plus amp hours with 100 usable. The, the reason that's kind of important is if you follow the development of Little Blue, then you know that we had all sorts of issues when we were trying to cook with the rice cooker. And um, it wasn't so much an issue of generating enough power it was an issue of using up too much power. What what happens is um, if you only have like 100 amp hours, and even though I was charging it through the alternator, you know, running the alternator while the inverter was converting the battery power to 120 volts to run the rice cooker, okay, it works. But the problem is the battery drains down. And what happened during that those episodes that you saw? If, if I was just cooking and demonstrating, I could do it and it looks like everything's fine. But the reality is, if you have to live in it and use it every day, if you don't go driving your car or run your car an additional 30 minutes or so afterwards, the battery pack drains down. And um, then you're running on top of that, because I'm in Florida, I typically run the 12 volt fan all night. You know, that, that was in those days. If you, if you watched all those episodes where I was doing the knife gig, and I was traveling across the state of Florida. I would basically get off work, cook food while I was driving, which used power from the, um, the battery bank, but it was generating it while I was driving. But then I would be stopped for the night because I basically drove and the food was cooking. And then, you know, when the food finished cooking, I was at my destination where I was gonna sleep for the night. And so the battery would not be at 100%. I, it probably was more like at about 50% or so. And if I wanted it at 100%, I'd have to run the car an additional 15, 20 minutes, which I often didn't do. I just shut it off. But then, because I ran the fan all night, I drained the battery down to um, below safety level. Safety level is like 50%, you know, on a, um, on a lead acid battery, such as an RV battery, you know, um, even though they're deep cycle, they really shouldn't go down below 50%. So knowing all those things, when I upgraded Little Blue's power system to 200 amp hours, it um, it was enough to, to run the food cooker and then still run the fans all night. Matter of fact, I could run three fans, you know, instead of just one, because I had more than I had 200 more than two. Well, I had about 230 amp hours, and out of that 115, roughly 100 amp hours was usable. So. And even then, I still ran the rice cooker. I mean, when I ran the rice cooker, I had the inverter system turned on, you know, the, um, the alternator charging the battery bank. It was enough to, to cook, you know, drive, I mean, cook while I was driving, park, and then run the fan all night and sleep through and not have issues the next day with the battery dying, you know, battery being drained too much. So 200 amp hours is the minimum I recommend for a fully functional system. Now, that may not seem like that big a deal, but when you're dealing with a little space like this car, it's something to really ponder. <laughs> because, uh, one, batteries right now with current technology, 
it's notoriously large and heavy unless you go with lithium ion and then you're talking a thousand dollars just for like 100 amp hours which i'm not going to spend um, you know i'm trying to do cheap that, that's always been the, the the running theme of this channel is let's try to do things as cheap as possible and make it good enough and it doesn't have to be the most luxurious it doesn't have to be the very bestest it just needs to be good enough, you know, good enough to function every day and actually be usable and be affordable and easy, easy to fix, easy to put together. So I'm going to use two lead acid um, deep cycle batteries that will give me 200 amp hours and try to figure out how to mount them in here. I mean, the ideal thing would be you could just put it at the, you know, the right here behind the seat. There's a little area where the feet normally go. The problem is, I don't know if I can put two whole batteries on one side. And you're like, well, you can spread it out, one on each side, and that'll help with um, the weight distribution on the car. Because you, know, you don't want the car too heavy on one side. That's also a problem, because the car doesn't steer right, and doesn't do things right. So you want to kind of spread the weight out. Well, I'm going to try to fit it onto one side if I can, but I don't know. Not until you take the batteries to actually fit them in there. And I'm also going to be putting it in, not just the batteries, but in a, um, you know, battery ba um, battery boxes. Those little black battery boxes from Walmart. Uh, the reason for doing all it like that is so that you can easily lift it up and get it out. Remember, I'm, I'm not making a full-blown permanent modification to the, the vehicle. I'm making it so you can take it apart in a few minutes. So the battery is going to be the hardest part to remove because it's going to be heavy. You're going to have two full-size deep cycle batteries in here. I'm going to keep the 750 watt inverter. So that's a lot of power. This car, this Pontiac Vibe, has a built-in inverter. The inverter will go up to 100 watts. So if all you were doing was running like a computer, you know, a laptop or something, you could plug it in and turn on. You know, it lets you pull the car battery to, to power the 100 watt. And if you were driving, you know, somewhere and you had a friend or your wife or whoever sitting here, they could run a DVD player, a computer or whatever, and plug it into a 120 volt outlet. And when you flip it on, it runs in 120 volt mode. You know, the cigarette lighter has a, next to it has a 120 volt plug. And basically you're pulling the power off the vehicle's um, starter battery. But that won't do for what we want to do because 100 watts is not enough to run the rice cooker. Not unless you run it in low mode. I mean, like like this vehicle in an emergency, if you didn't have all the other stuff, like the power inverter, the battery banks and stuff like that, you could buy a slow cooker. You know what I'm talking about? The, the little pot cookers, the, the little slow pot cookers. They're like little pots. Um, they only go up to, I think, about 38 to 48 watts. So, you know, they're 120 volts, and they're designed to plug in the house, and they, they cook slowly. But they only go up to 48 watts or so. That means you can get one of those, plug it directly into this vehicle's uh, built-in inverter, you know, drive the car, and turn on the inverter, and cook food without having to have a complicated battery system. But then, you know, you're, you're talking about a road trip somewhere. So if you were driving, like, you know, for a couple of hours, and you wanted to cook food using this vehicle without all that fancy attachment you could do that because you're driving it's generating electricity to power you know to restock the power being used from the uh, starter battery because you're pulling the power directly from the power battery but in our situation i want to cook like a rice cooker just like i did before i wanted to show you know i don't need it right now but i could potentially um i wanted to show that you could cook uh, rice and meat, you know, basically a whole meal. Rice and meat or stew or soups, uh, noodles, whatever. Just like you saw in the past. So, 200, um, 200 amp hours, 750 watts, which would allow me to run two rice cookers if I really wanted to, even though I would probably run one at a time. But I'll have two rice cookers so I can have two bowls. And then trying to rig it for cooking. So, you know, a lot of people would say, well, just rig it back there behind your seat, just like, um, you know, like a real camper. Well, that works fine if you're parked and you want to cook like that. 
but the car has to run when you're running those rice cookers because it's going to be charging the system off the um, the alternator and I want to be able to monitor the food so the way to do it the way I did it in little blue was I had the um, the rice cooker right here beside me you know behind kind of in between the two seats which I could do on this one potentially but it's kind of tight back there I'm actually contemplating making a um, making a little kitchenette for the front seat area You're like what do you mean well I'm thinking of making a little cooking area <laughs> so this design is going to be kind of interesting because the vehicle has to be able to carry one two three I want to be able to carry three passengers just like little blue okay so it has to be easily convertible to carry three passengers like in a few minutes but it also has to have a full-blown kitchenette that supports a rice cooker and a uh, butane stove okay and um, able to store food so I'm gonna kind of show you how what my plan is to do that and I uh, it's gonna be kind of interesting because we're talking very tight space I think because it'll be mostly me using it right now and, and look, until my wife and I decide to travel, you know, if, if this vehicle can make it across the country. Um, it's going to be designed for one person for full-time living, not two. And if the vehicle does really well, like doesn't break down or anything, because, you know, I don't know how, this thing's got, I think, more than 300,000 miles on it. Yeah. It's a very, it's a very high miles. I think it's got more than three hundred thousand. The odometer stopped at a certain point, and that's why I got such a good price on it. You know, was um, it's got a high, 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 high miles, even though it seems to run fine. And right now, I, I trust it, but until I start taking road trips, you know, and seeing how it behaves, you saw what happened with Timothy Sienna. It, um, I think it blew a valve or something, something serious, which effectively killed the vehicle. So, I'm going to rig this for one person full-time living. It is going to feature a kitchen with one rice cooker, two rice cooker, you know, bowls, but one rice cooker that can be used to cook food. Um, you can also run the um, butane stove, so I can cook using gas, okay? It's going to be cooked with a combination of gas and electric. Like, most of the time when I'm cooking, I will probably cook, you know, when I'm cooking while I'm driving, I will cook using um, electric, because electric's free. And um, when I'm parked somewhere, I will cook using the butane system, because I don't have to run the car, and the butane creates, like, a really high heat very fast. So it can be used for, you know, like, I might cook... What I might do is cook the rice while driving and then get to the destination and then cook the meat or the food or heat up something using the butane system. So it's going to be a combination cooking system. Even though I could cook fully off butane if I wanted to, I could cook fully off um, propane if I wanted to or, or um, electric. The other question is um, charging, battery charging systems. Um, to keep things simple and using the materials I already have from various builds and stuff, I'm going to charge the house battery, which we're planning on trying to install 200 amp hours. 200 amp hours of power, so it can run power tools, it can run uh, electric rice cooking and everything. That'll be charged, just like Little Blue, using the alternator, okay? And then some of you are like, well, what about the uh, solar panels? Are you, are you gonna put solar panels on it? I'm planning on it, but I was looking at the the roof space. You know, you need um, real estate, you need space to mount solar panels. The roof on this thing is really small, and there's an antenna on the roof, which I don't want to break or cover or remove the antenna because, you know, it's nice to have radio, you know, airwave radio, so you can get, like, in case you don't have Wi-Fi or whatever. I know people People nowadays uh, assume you always have Wi-Fi and stuff, but if you're in remote areas, you might not have access to internet, okay? So if you need the news or something, you might need to be able to pick stuff off the airwave. Uh, so I wanna keep the, the, fun, um, 
the radio system here intact and working. You know, the radio system, if you saw it, he actually has a movie player and stuff. <laughs> it, it, it's a really nice vehicle. But anyhow, um, so the roof space is not big enough for my 255-watt um, solar panel on Little Blue. So I won't be able to just pull that panel and put it on here. You know, otherwise, if I did, I mean, if I really wanted to, if I was having, you know, if, I was, if this was like Mad Max and we were in the apocalypse, um, I would probably have put the 255 watt on here and skip the radio because by then the, the radio broadcast stations are all destroyed. <laughs> You're in a post-apocalyptic world. You know, um, I would take the maximum power capability, which would be the 255 um, watt solar panel. But because I'm trying to um, just make it so that, you know, it can still be stealth and also not tear things up, I'm going to take my old... Um, solar panel from Harbor Freight. I think it was a 25, 15 or 25, I think it was a 25. I think it was a 25 watt panel. So it's kind of smaller. It's a 25 watt panel from um, Harbor Freight that I bought. I don't know if you, if you followed me when I built the hut out in the woods. That was what I was using to try to charge the, uh, the battery up. But it turned out it wasn't enough. 25 watts wasn't enough to charge that battery overnight out in the woods because trees were blocking the, the solar panels. And 25 watts really isn't that much. But it's useful to have because it can be used for trickle charging. And um, what I mean by trickle charging is this. What I found with charging battery banks is, um, is that if you try to charge batteries completely off the alternator, like I've been doing in Little Blue, it doesn't 100% charge it. It'll bring it up to maybe 70 to 90% charge. That's it. Okay. When you do high speed charging, it turns out, and I, I know the, um, the electrical engineers, you know, the battery specialists, and they all know how this works. It's some kind of formula. but. As the battery charges, uh, we're talking about lead acid battery. I don't know about lithium, but lead acid battery, as it starts to charge the deep cycle ones, as it starts to fill up with energy that you put in from the alternator, you need to lower the charge rate. And that's what a charge controller does. The, the charge controller steps down the charging rate so that eventually you get a trickle charge. But we're wiring the wire directly from the alternator to the battery. So that means it's a constant 12, I mean, um, it'll send about 14, between 13.6 13 13 to 14.2 volts is how much the alternator puts out. It'll send that directly to the battery and try to charge the battery at 14 volts roughly. And it turns out that if you try to charge the battery at 14 volts all the way to the end, it won't do it. It'll go up to a certain point, and then it just doesn't charge. You know, it'll charge up to that point. So you gotta you gotta step down the voltage, and that means using a charge controller, which I'm not gonna bother. And you're like, why not? Well, we have a solar panel. Now the solar panel does have a charge controller, okay? And so what will happen is I'll mount the 25 watt um, solar panel on the roof kind of mount it there and make it so that I can remove it without damaging the roof, you know, so I might kind of mount it on the cargo rack. But basically, make it so it can be removed, but um, it'll come in through a little wire to the solar charge controller, and I'm going with a cheap little one, the one you can get for $15 online. And some people say, well, that's junk denoy. Well, I'm using it in a little blue, and I've been using it, and it works great. For $15, you cannot beat that. I think you could, if you shop around online, you could get it for under twelve dollars, seven to twelve dollars. It's a full-blown charge controller. It's a. It says that it's MPPT, but it's not. It's PWM, which is the older technology, and the build on it is kind of junky. It's like plastic, almost like a toy. But I've been using it on a little blue now since I put it in and put in the two hundred twenty-five watt, and it works great on that. So I'm going to try to use that same charge controller on the 25-watt Harbor Freight. 
even though the Harbor Freight, when I bought it, had its own charge controller, which was a tiny little PWM with just a little light. You know, it's junky. Uh, they, they sold it as a kit, is what I bought, the 25-watt kit, which the charge controller was crap. I think it worked, but you could not really tell because it just had a light that came on and said it was charging. It didn't tell you the, the voltage or anything like that. But I'm, I'm going to go with the nicer one, the, the $15 one. <laughs> $15 being nicer. But I'm going with that one. Um, and that will charge. Hopefully, the what will happen is the alternator while I'm driving, I can flip the switch just like on a little blue. It will pull um, a lot of amps from the... Um, you know, excess amps from the vehicle battery to charge the house battery while I'm driving somewhere. And then, you know, when I'm parked somewhere, or even while I'm driving, the solar panel will continuously charge from the sun. And it goes through the charge controller, which means that charge controller um, checks the battery level and will throttle down the charge rate as needed. The idea is to keep your batteries at 100% as much as possible before you hit the nighttime when the sun goes away. So during the daytime, when I'm driving, it'll charge off the, um, the alternator. And then when I'm parked, and even while I'm driving actually, it'll continue to charge off the slower rate, trickle charge, off the, um, the solar panels. Then by the time nighttime hits, in theory, <laughs> the battery's at a full 100% with 200 amp hours. You're like, why is that so important to him? It's important because I'm in Florida. <laughs> if, if any of you are, are real van dwellers or campers and stuff and have tried to sleep in Florida at night, okay, even sometimes during the winter, it is hot and humid and sticky. So, you know... Um, I plan on running two or three fans every night, just like I did in Little Blue at night. So having 200 amp hours and having um, three fans that I can run means that I'll be plenty cool enough, you know. And this is this is where we start to talk about little bonus features. Okay, the kitchen was a bonus, which I, I think I've got worked out how I'm going to do that. Um, I'm also going to install a TV and a video game player system, just like I did in Little Blue. So for being a little vehicle, what, you know, this is all up here right now. We're not sure if it's going to fully work, but I have an idea of how to do it and do it in such a way that it's not permanent. Okay. Remember, the key word is easy to assemble and disassemble and, and similar to Tim's system, it's modular. It can be removed in second segments, sections. And I want to make it versatile enough so that... Um, the system is usable even when it's in regular vehicle mode for driving because that's where I'm going to store the stuff is in the vehicle itself. So the vehicle will store everything it needs to convert into a camper when it's in vehicle mode, just like little blue does, including the TV. And if I can get it to work right, the TV will work even in vehicle mode, which means my kids, when they're in here going somewhere, a long road trip or something, they can watch TV or they can play video games. You know, sadly, I think only one can play because it's going to be in the back seat area. I mean, I could put it up here, up front, and make it so that, you know, but then the front has a big TV in it. Which, if if, if I was really doing it, a full-blown conversion, you know, without having to carry passengers, like it didn't have to convert back to becoming a regular car, I would put the TV right here, right? Uh, oh, you guys don't see my arm, but... The passenger seat right by the, the windshield, there's an area there that you could mount a TV. And it's a pretty big screen TV, like a 19 or 20 inch TV. You could put a TV right here, like where I'm sitting, right up front here, and mount it. So when you lay down in the back, you have like the TV at your feet, you know? it's it's a, And if you do it right, you can actually fold the TV back down and hide it so that the, the vehicle looks like a regular vehicle when somebody's looking at it from outside. They won't see a TV set sitting there. That, uh, that is a dead giveaway that this isn't a regular vehicle. It's actually a house. But the way I'm going to do it, I'm going to try to mount the TV behind me right here. Remember, this is all theory. It's all theory until you put it in and say, shit, it won't fit. 
or you know there's some kind of technical difficulty that's making it impossible but I have a theory on how to mount it how to do it and make it so that you can watch TV back here so when you're laying down you can watch if you have your head up towards the front you can just lay and look at it sideways if you have your head in the back which I still haven't determined yet the uh, the optimum laying down position um, you can watch the TV so uh, it'll have TV and once it has TV I can hook up um, Roku or whatever and get you know internet and stream movies if I want to, just like you guys have seen it in blue, how I stream, stream, you know, um, um, Pluto TV and YouTube. So you can, just like a house, basically think of the, the car as being a little super ultra mini RV. So it will have a TV, it will have video game system with 5,000 plus games, the same system you see in little blue, basically. Um, what else will it have? I'm planning on having drawers. So you can have clothing storage. Okay, so it's gonna have a little food pantry. It's gonna have, and you're like, he's gonna fit all this in here? <laughs> well, it fits in my head right now. Whether or not I'll be able to actually pull it off. You know, you know, you always have these grand ideas on how things are gonna work. But until you actually do it in real life, you don't really know. So I have an idea of how the build out is going to go so that it it is um, modular. Timothy kind of gave me the idea for being modular, you know, with his build. And I'm like, so I'll try to build it somewhat modular, not somewhat, pretty much fully modular. Um, so things can be removed within a few minutes. And the vehicle reverts back to like, like it is right now. So that'll handle entertainment, it'll handle news, you know, for rainy days. Uh, you guys saw me trapped inside the little blue that one time it rained the whole week, like five days. It rained straight in Florida, four or five days. So I was stuck inside. I'll be able to watch movies on it. I might even install a DVD player. Um, so, I mean, it, this thing actually has a DVD player built in right now. It's got a, um, the console here has a little t um, TV. The, the, the radio on here is one of those nice radios with a TV display, a little display, and it has a backup camera and everything. This is like decked out. This vehicle's like, woo! Considering it's, um, it's used and old, it's very nice, you know? So that will handle all that. As far as the bedding, I'm planning on using real bed. Well, not, I don't know if you say real, but it's, um, I'm planning on using the same bedding that I'm using in Little Blue. So it's going to have the, the cushion mattress. Not cushion, but real sleeping mattress. So it'll be really comfortable. I don't want to... I, I could go if you wanted to go simple. Like I said, if you were doing a weekend camper or something, you could toss one or two sleeping bags down and you could sleep in this vehicle. Basically use it like a tent that's um, better than a tent. But because I am making it for more on the full-time living side, you know, potentially... Um, it's going to have to have a comfortable bed. And for those of you who contemplate building a, a camper van or anything like that, you may not understand it, but um, the bed is your one of your most important components, okay? So don't skimp on the bed. Uh, make the most comfortable bed that you can because that's where you're going to be spending the majority of your time in your camper van is sleeping. So the bed, it's very important to make sure that whatever you decide on for a bed system, that it is something that you can sleep in comfortably and not wake up with any bumps or sores or, you know, um, what is it, um, aches and stuff like that where your body had to sleep over a lump or something. So it's important to have a flat area for the bed, which I have to double check and make sure that everything's going to be flat. And when I say flat, I mean smooth, smooth surface. Cause I don't know if you guys saw the, the movie or the, the book, The Princess and the Pea. You know, a little tiny pea in the bed mattress and she could feel it. That's what it's like on a real bed when you're trying to sleep. You know, you might not notice it if you're just kind of laying on it. But if you sleep on it every day, you're going to notice even a little tiny pea in your mattress. <laughs> it'll start to annoy you and it'll cause an irritation. It'll cause you to not sleep well. So it's important to have a good bed. So we're going to try to have a full-size... Well, not a full size, but a, a double bed in here. Okay, if I can do it. 
And I tried to do a double bed. Um, may or may not carry. It just depends on space, because once again, remember this is smaller than a um, than a van, a minivan, much smaller than a minivan. It's two thirds the size of a minivan. I might try to carry some camping gear, like a tent and sleeping bags and some other stuff for in the event that I decide to go out into the um, wilderness and set up a tent. But really, the vehicle is like a tent. It's like a super high-end tent. So, tent might not be necessary. It might be safer to just sleep inside the vehicle than in a tent and get attacked by bears or cougars. We have, you know, you guys know I'm in Florida. We have uh, the, the Florida Panthers, it's like this black cougar. So it's a real danger here in Florida. Um, so basically a full-blown RV, mini RV. You know, that's the plan. What else? What are the systems? So we got power, we got cooking, we have entertainment. Oh, for the windows, I, I'm contemplating different things. I had contemplated doing curtains again, but I think for ease of use, we're going to go with a... Um, flat panels that can just that are going to be custom shaped and designed to just pop up over the window to blacken them at night the i may pay i don't know or i might try to do it myself for uh limo tenting on the side windows you know this sadly this vehicle doesn't have tinting the the glass on it is not tinted at all so having black tinting on it will help you know to hide the fact that it's not a, a regular vehicle inside it's a, a house so i may look into having it professionally tinted but they tend to charge like a lot i think more than a hundred dollars so i may try to do my own cheap tent job i think i can buy tent for like 15 20 dollars but you know tenting is one of those things that's you got to have some skills and you got to have patience uh, those of you who have seen me do anything, you know that I don't have too much patience. I like to, I don't like it, I, don't, I mean, I like it perfect and everything, but I don't like to take the time to make it perfect. I just take the time to make it good enough. So maybe I will do the tinting the same way, just good enough, you know. But if I tint it myself, I can probably do it for $20, $25 or less. And that way, the, wind, the glass is tinted, and um, it'll help with... Um, hiding the fact that you're in here but the you know even a window tent will allow light when like at nighttime if you're inside somebody outside will see you as if there was no tinting it's only good during the daytime so i do definitely need window covers last time i took cardboard you know remember the temporary build i used cardboard the the black cardboard from dollar tree and i cut them to shape and i put it in and it worked but, you know, it looks really bad. It's like, remember, I'm, I'm trying to build this as if it was somewhat permanent. So I want it to look somewhat nice, like a home almost. I don't want it to look like I'm a poor person living out of a car. <laughs> even, though, even though that's what it is. That's the reality of it. You know, if you're living out of a car, unless you are living out of a car and you have a good job and you're making money and you're doing it to save money so that when you get done with this, this period of time, you end up with a whole bunch of money in the bank account, you know, that then, then, you know, you might not mind it looking so poor. But for me, I'm going to try to make it look somewhat nice. So uh, I'm still working out a design on what I'll use exactly. Um, contemplated using some kind of foam, you know, um, you know, they sell like the yoga mats, the foam, that kind of foam. Thinking of doing that, but the issue that you run into with foam, you can't really fold it. So then you have all these big chunks of foam. When you're not using it, they got to be stored somewhere. And well, like I said, this is a tiny little car. So if you have to store it somewhere, you know, you say, well, you can put it in the back, you know, that back storage area. That's where I would have to store it. But remember, I'm also going to have to store the, um, the mattress back there and everything else that's not being used. And then the other problem with it is when it's being used as a regular car, I want it to be able to carry stuff too. You know, like um, if, if I go to pick up my kids, it's got to carry their clothes and stuff for the weekend or whatever. So it's got to function like a regular car. 
So you can't just have it so that when you fold it up, the whole back area is not accessible. Although that could end up happening once I see how big everything is. It's easy to talk about what all will fit in here and have it all worked out in your mind how it all fits. But when you go to lay it out and put it in, you say, holy schmoly, this was much bigger than I thought. And there could be a piece of the vehicle jutting out blocking a, a plan. You know, like trying to put the TV back here. That could be a problem. I think I know how to do it. But until I do it, I don't really know for sure. I just have... Let me put it this way. If you want to build something like this, don't have it... Don't do these elaborate drawings and have it all set in stone on how everything's going to work because I can guarantee you it won't work the way you think. What I recommend doing is having a rough idea in your head of how you're going to lay things out. And you might have some drawings, but they don't have to be really detailed because your drawing is not going to be accurate at all. So have a rough idea of how you want things laid out and then build it on the fly and what that means is you know where you want the TV but don't really work out the full details of how it's going to be mounted until you get access to the vehicle and you get your wood or whatever you're going to use and you just measure and cut it and do it like that ad hoc you're just putting it together it's like um, unlike a puzzle where you have the pieces already pre-cut and you try to fit them in exactly. When you're building something like this, it's hard to have it pre-cut and ready to go. You measure it and you go, oh, this is this tall, and you put it in. Okay? That will guarantee that it'll fit. And um, later on, when you go to put it back after you finish the modular design and have it, you, you know, you might want to take a picture as to how everything fits together. Then it's like a puzzle. But the, the initial build, you're going to start from scratch and you're going to just make it up as you go along. So, you know, the idea will be to make it up as I go along. Um, make it so that it is easy to assemble and disassemble per Timothy's uh, modular ideas. Um, I do want to make it look really nice because even though for me right now this is being built as a um, more of a fun project and a how-to because I want to show all the stuff I've learned from, you know, the six years, five or six years of living in a van and all the various systems I went through. What worked, what didn't work, um, what would work better, possibly, okay? And um, basically share with you the ultimate build, you know. My ultimate build would be a real vehicle, like a, a full-size vehicle, and turn that into an RV with a working shower and bathroom and everything. But I don't have access to that vehicle and I'm trying to do this cheap. Uh, most of what I describe here, I already have the components because I'm pulling them from Little Blue. You know, so I will have um, the components already. Uh, so the cost is going to be very minimal. I might have to buy a couple pieces of wood and stuff, but I, if I can, I'll just use the wood from Little Blue. So it's being built with recycled components. I'm going to disassemble Little Blue, so there's plenty of wood there, so I don't even think I even have to buy wood. So... I expect the cost of this build for me personally to be less than $100 to have a full-blown, nice working super mini RV. Um, cost for somebody doing it from scratch, you're looking at $200 for the batteries, $40 for the inverter, so that's $250, right? $240, but let's say $250 so far, charge controller which we'll throw in there at 250 um, If you buy your solar panels online, a vehicle like this might be able to take 50, possibly 100 watts. I'd have to see what the 100 watt size is. But could probably handle up to 50 watts if you got one of the square ones. You know what I'm talking about? The square solar panels? It would probably fit up there. I'm getting uh, 25 watt because that's what I have already. But if I could have, you know, if I was going to order one and build one from scratch, I would go with the 50 or a 100 watt if I, the 100 watt would fit up there. Oh, the other thing I didn't want to block was, um, I know you can't see it here, but see how the light came in? That's from me opening up. This thing has a, a, a sunroof, and the sunroof has a sliding sunroof, so the light can come in if I want to. I, I can lay down and look at the stars at night. I can also pop that window up, 
so I could get air circulating through if I wanted to, you know, from the top. The, the issue would be just mosquitoes and other stuff, but we'll deal with that too, how to deal with mosquitoes. And, and so you're gonna get to see all that. I am, like I said, I'm going to put together basically all of my skills and knowledge that I picked up from actually living in Little Blue for the past um, basically four years on and off, four or five years on and off. Plus previous, you know, experience from other van builds. So you're going to see this as my ultimate as far as um, pushing it, you know, with the cheapest cost and the, the I guess, the most stable system. You know, one that actually works and doesn't melt. Um, as usual, we're going to have other stuff that, that, you know, that normal builds have, like um, we're going to have carbon monoxide detector, fire hydrant, basically all the things that you normally have. So when this gets done, if, if, it, if it becomes anything like what I envision right now, I think you guys are going to enjoy it. Um, let me know if you guys want to see the build, and then I can kind of show it. But honestly, my, my feelings about it is I don't think I'm going to film the build. I think I'm just going to build it out and then show you the finished product. The reason is, if I show you the build, what you're going to see is a lot of trial and error. And it's kind of boring, you know, you, you see me working for um, maybe hours or even a day or two on something, and then it didn't work. So watching a video of me uh, doing something for a day that didn't work is kind of counterproductive. I mean. It might be entertaining and it might show you what not to do, but see, we don't know it until we do it and then it doesn't work. <laughs> and then it's like, well, that was a wasted effort. You know, other than experience, which is not really wasted when you learn something. But I think it might be better for me to just build the whole thing out and then um, give you a tour once it's done and then show you the, the various components and systems and how they actually got implemented and, and any difficulties I encountered. So that way when you go to build your own, you actually have a working model that you know works. So that design worked versus just uh, coming up with one and then you're following along and it doesn't work, which I think is kind of wasted energy on everybody's part. So make sure you comment down below um, on the video, comment, you know, if you're doing the live stream, come back when the video is finished uploading and then comment in the comments because I'm not sure I'll be able to scroll through. I'll try to scroll through the live stream chats to see if anyone wants to see the series. But I don't really think I want to do a series because there's a lot of other videos I want to do. Um, so I'll probably just show the completed product. So the next time you see this vehicle, uh, more than likely, it'll have the complete build, you know, or at least most of the build, if not the entire thing. But it'll be functional as a uh, little mini RV. So I look forward to that video. I want to thank you all for joining me. I am going to um, head out. Uh, um, let's see. I'm trying to get out here. I'm reading your comments, but I'm at a stoplight right now. Hard wants to know if this is a new car. It's really not a new car. It's a um, car I bought for my wife, uh, but she's not using it right now, so I'm using it, and I got her permission to modify it, well, not really modify, I told her, and that's why it's being built like this, <laughs> I'm not going to fully modify it, because if I fully modified it, it means cutting parts and screwing and bolting things in, this is going to be not fully modified, it's going to look almost fully modified, but it's not a real build. It's a modular build, like Timothy said. You know, like Timothy did on his. Um, it's going to be removable. So it's not going to be one of those that you bolt stuff in. You know, I'll have to figure out how to... i have to figure out how to hold things in place and stuff without bolting things. You know, so that that's going to be one of the... Um, one of the challenges are going to be building it in such a way that it's not permanent <clears throat> it's not even semi-permanent it's removable so there's a lot of personal challenges with this build for me i'm doing a lot of stuff that i've not done before like um designing it so well one it's a small vehicle it's basically a car you know without a trunk it's a hatchback basically <clears throat> so 
I'm designing for such a small vehicle. Okay. The the second thing is I'm packing it with a lot of luxury features like the kitchen, the living room, the um, you know closets, the pantry. Uh, there's going to be a lot of stuff put into this little space. And um, the other challenge is to make it look nice. I don't want to make it look trashy. I want to make it look like a, like a nice little house. <laughs> because I could potentially have to live in it. The other thing is it has to be flexible. Because eventually I might take a road trip in this with my wife. And if I do that, it's going to have to sleep two people comfortably. Remember what I said about sleeping? you got to be... That's got to... You know... I don't think people understand it, but the ability to sleep comfortably in a vehicle is probably the number one, the number one uh, issue that you need to keep at the top of your priority, you know, for designing a vehicle. And people who don't live in their vehicle don't know that. They, they will think of the bed as almost an afterthought. They're like, well, sleeping comfortably is okay, so we're going to build it like this, so we're going to go with this. And it's okay when you're laying there testing it for five minutes, or you might take it out for one day to, to go camping in it, and it's okay. But if you're trying to live in it weeks after weeks and months after months, you're not gonna want, you know, well, I say you, I mean me, from personal experience. Some people can sleep in a sleeping bag every single day. You know, in Asia, some of the, the, the Japanese, I think they sleep on little mattresses made with rice grains. You know, not rice grains, but the rice um, husk. You know, you know, rice normally comes in this little brown husk that's kind of hard, but it's almost like um, like what we use for the little popcorn fillers or whatever, but they're small little husks. And I think in Japan, they sleep on mattresses made out of that stuff. And I think even in Asia. So those things, to me, if I was Asian, I am Asian. <laughs> okay, if I if I had never been exposed to American mattresses with the spring and the um, cushion layers and the memory foam, okay, sleeping on a corn husk um, mattress would probably be very comfortable. <laughs> but now that I'm kind of spoiled, sleeping on a corn husk mattress. I don't think I could do it. I could do it for one day. I could do it for a week if I was visiting somewhere. But I don't think I'd want to do it for months and months on end. I want a nice mattress. You know, I want something that when I lay down, I'm in la-la land. I'm, I'm, I'm out. I'm gone. Anyhow, I'm going to let you guys go. I um, look forward to those videos or that video. Let me know what you want to do. Um, if you want me to try to do a series, I, I really don't. I'm leaning away from doing the series. I'm just going to do, a, like, one good video, you know. It'll be like a nice, quick tour. Because I think that's going to be the best way to do it. So, thank you for joining me. I appreciate you guys tuning in. If you haven't already hit the subscribe button, be sure to do so. Make sure to tap the notification bell. Until next time, everyone, take care. God bless you all. Please stay safe. Bye-bye now.